This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 961, recorded on December 8th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Uganda... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm recording this, as I told Vincent, um, outdoors using my iPhone for a light. Um, <laughs> I, I'm on the, the banks of the, the source of the Nile, so uh, the eastern part of Uganda here. So hopefully hopefully the quality will, uh, will be fine. There's a bit of a storm going on, so uh, if you hear a crashing, that's okay. That's just lightning and thunder. What's the uh, city that you're in, Daniel? Uh, it's called Jinja. Okay. So you can check that out. All right. Well, let me start. Let's get right into this. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And that's Nelson Mandela. So we'll continue on our focus on education. And I'm hoping to uh, to share a bit of information today. I'm going to start off with measles. Yes, this week I am adding measles. So people may be aware of the current outbreak um, in Ohio. I was going to say here, but I'm not in Ohio. Um, we're up to over 50 cases. Last I checked, it was 59, 20 individuals um, hospitalized. I just want to say, they are all unvaccinated, and actually the majority of the cases are in children less than two years of age. So as I mentioned, um, I'm recording this from Uganda and at the Foundation International Medical Relief of Children Clinic, so FIMRIC Clinic, on Monday, I saw a two-year-old boy who came in with fever, runny nose, feeling irritable, and that's an understatement, just miserable, eye irritation, um, cough, poor appetite, um, this was going on for about five days, just m really miserable, according to the mother. Um, initially, there was no rash. Then after about five days, he started to develop a rash on his face, spread down the neck and onto the chest. And we see him, he's got this rash. Uh, lungs were clear, child just incredibly miserable. Um, odd white grain-like lesions inside the mouth on the sides, testing um, including blood smear for malarial parasites was um, negative. Um, asked a little bit more, the child was not vaccinated. Um, so here we made the presumptive diagnosis of measles, started the individual on vitamin A and paracetamol. So just, just for those parents um, you know, out there, um, you know, what, what a miserable experience for an unvaccinated child to get infected. Um, influenza, um, you know, I put up for Vincent here, not doing great on vaccination and numbers keep increasing. You know, I know Yogi Berra said the hardest thing to predict is the future, but with the spread of respiratory pathogens, predicting the future is not that hard. If we start to see influenza activity before Thanksgiving, before Christmas, we can pretty much be assured with all the travel in our country that all the areas that were green are going to turn to red and dark purple, very high. So Vincent, can, can you see, uh, looking at this, this picture, the, the, what, which is the pre and which is the post Thanksgiving photo? For sure. The pre's got a lot of green <laughs> and yellow and the, the post is a lot of purple and red, for sure. Yeah, so th this is continuing to strain our hospitals. I mean, um, you know, this is when we see spread of respiratory pathogens. We'll, we'll talk a, a little bit as we get into our COVID section, just about what we know about respiratory pathogens, how to prevent their spread. Um, and, you know, the biggest thing for influenza, we, there's still time to get your flu vaccine. So go out there, get that done. Um, and think about your kids, get them that flu vaccine as well. Okay, our MPOX update. MPOX is not a gay disease or an African disease. MPOX is an infectious disease. So I started saying this from the beginning as I feared that the bias of only testing um, the MSM population would lead to missed cases and delayed diagnoses leading to more severe cases in women and children. And yes, the article MPOX, formerly monkeypox in women, epidemiological features and clinical characteristics of MPOX cases in Spain, April to November 2022 was published as a rapid communication in Euro surveillance. 158 MPOX cases in adult women, greater than or equal to 16 years were reported in Spain. Two of them were pregnant. 
Um, and there was a statistically significant delay in diagnosis, as, as I sort of suggested, warned. Um, I do want to highlight the fact that despite a reduction in MPOX cases in Europe and the US, people continue to struggle in Africa with MPOX without access to vaccines and medications, I should say limited access. Um, and I'm going to leave a link um, to a nice PBS News Hour video. Um, but now on a positive note, in the same lines, we did hear that the government of the Republic of Korea, so that's South Korea, for those of you that have been watching FIFA, um, through the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, um, there's going to be a donation of a batch of MPOX vaccines to Africa through the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Africa CDC. The donation was announced during a bilateral meeting between the acting director of Africa CDC um, and KDCA commissioner um, on the margins of the seventh global health security agenda ministerial meeting held in the Republic of Korea in Seoul. All right, Ebola. Kind of perfect timing to be talking about Ebola and being in Uganda. Mostly good news here. Um, just this week, um, you can tell me if this was updated, Vincent, um, Uganda discharged its last Ebola patient. Um, we may need to wait a little longer to get past the incubation period, um, but all signs look good. Um, when I was in Baduda, I had the opportunity to see patients with one of the clinical officers, uh, Jamela Makame. Um, she actually did a CME on Ebola for the clinic on Tuesday evening. Um, in Uganda, the expectation is not if, but when the next Ebola outbreak will occur. This is the fifth Ebola outbreak in Uganda. Um, we had one with Zaire in 2019, one with Ebola Thai forest. We had now five with Ebola Sudan. Um, so, you know, here in Uganda, it's a question of when. It's also a question of how well we're going to do. So uh, also, I'm going to say a little bit of encouraging news. Um, the night I arrived in Jinja, so this town, I arrived in Jinja on my way to Baduda last Saturday night. Um, I had the chance meeting with Hans Jörg Lang, um, who's actually been part of the Ebola response efforts here in Uganda. Um, you know, standard science nerd chat where out came the computer and he shared with me a PowerPoint full of data and photos. I was in heaven. <laughs> and um, a bit of this is actually in, in an article that he, um, he published, a communication published in The Lancet Infectious Diseases, triage of patients with Ebola virus disease. Um, this can be accessed for free. Um, and he's very focused on ensuring that treatment is focused on, on creating and maintaining a patient-centered approach with lots of communication and transparency. Um, so they actually, there's some pictures of these in the article, but there are these rapidly deployable treatment cubes, um, and you can actually see pictures. Um, and there's this concept of creating this transparent cube where you've got the high-risk area inside that cube where the patient is, the patient is being taken care of, but there's a low-risk zone right outside. So the mother, the family, the, the community leaders can see what's going on. Um, and I think a lot was learned from the large West African Ebola Zaire outbreak um, where um, a lot of efforts were really focused on isolation and containment and not as much effort was focused on treatment. Um, and actually, as I spoke um, with my colleague, um, because of this transparency, because of the communication, um, it was felt that this was much more rapidly controlled. Um, the other thing he talked about, I think this is really important, is in the entire country of Uganda, it takes, well, from my clinic in, in the femur clinic in Baduda, it takes about eight hours to get to Entebbe. That's the only place in the entire country where you can get an Ebola test. So really a lot of effort to let's have um, testing access all throughout the country. So when there's a problem, you're not waiting eight hours, 10 hours, 14 hours for that diagnosis while someone is in an isolation um, situation. You can get that diagnosis, rule it in, rule it out, either start treatment or um, move forward if that's not what they have. All right, COVID, yes, we are there. Um, there is a post-holiday increase in COVID-related hospitalizations in the U.S. after the Thanksgiving holiday. I'm not sure who predicted that wasn't going to happen, um, but we are seeing a COVID hospitalization increase, stressing hospitals, already dealing with RSV, the flu, and the other medical challenges. COVID hospitalizations passed 35,000 
thousand, being higher than it has been in over three months. Um, we'll need to see if this translates into an increase in deaths in the coming weeks, so we'll keep everyone updated. I'm really curious to watch that. Um, are the vaccines holding out against what I think is the hardest uh, parameter is, is deaths, right? Because people may get hospitalized for COVID now during that first week, a sort of a new phenomenon. They're nauseated. Um, they just can't do well at home. Maybe that outpatient doc is not comfortable starting Paxlovid, so they end up in the hospital. Um, but we'll have to see, um, is the effect of the vaccines durable against death the most severe outcome? You got a hand up there, Vincent. I have a question. If these hospitalizations, you show this graph of rise in hospitalization, do we know is this for COVID or with COVID? So I think there's two questions there. So yeah, the first is um, it's hard to know. Um, you know, how reliable is that? You know, does it get coded as COVID when it really was something else and they tested positive for COVID? So that's important. That's why I think that death is a much better, harder number to work. Um, and the other is there's two types of hospitalizations for COVID. There's COVID first week, I feel crummy. And then there's COVID week two, early inflammatory, hypoxic, pulmonary support. Um, and we don't have a different code. We really should have a different code. The other topic that we have touched on periodically is whether most of us have already had COVID, including that chunk of asymptomatic cases. So the MMWR report, SARS-CoV-2 Serology and Self-Reported Infection Among Adults, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, United States, August 2021 through May 2022 was released. And in this report, they hear, we hear that a total of 91.5% of adults included in the NHANES and SARS-CoV-2 anti-S antibodies um, had, 91.5% had anti-S antibodies, right? So that could come from infection or vaccination. And 41.6% of a convenient sample of adults had both. So they have spike and, and anti-nucleic um, antibodies. So suggesting that about 44% or so, about a little over 40% have actually been infected. So as I've discussed with Rich Conant, we also know that having anti-nucleic capsid antibodies is not 100% sensitive for infection, particularly in those with prior vaccination. So I'm going to leave a, a few links here to the papers that, that discuss this, the paper, Serological Markers of SARS-CoV-2 Infection, Anti-Nuclear Capsid Antibody Positivity May Not Be a, the Ideal Marker of Natural Infection in Vaccinated Individuals, published in JID. I like, that's like a surgeon title. Um, <laughs> they, looked <at> the, <laughs> they looked at the antibody response following vaccination in over 4,000 healthcare workers. Of the participants that went on to become PCR positive, only 26% had detectable anti N antibody. So a bit of a surprise there. Um, the other paper, um, sensitivity of anti SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein antibody for breakthrough infections, my favorite term, during the epidemic of the Omicron variants was published in the Journal of Infection. Here they reported a 78% sensitivity with PCR confirmed infection occurring in the two months after a booster vaccination, they looked at 200 individuals. So still missing some, not quite as bad as that first paper. All right, COVID, children, and other vulnerable populations. As I like to repeat over and over again, children are at risk from COVID. Now we'll move into that pre-exposure, transmission, testing, have a plan, use tests intelligently. Um, let's try to be safe out there. Now non-pharmaceutical interventions, masks, lots of concerns as I've discussed with the quality of the studies, risk for bias, but a few important studies that are informative. In general, the science favors mass use and suggests a hierarchy with N95s offering the highest level of protection. Um, and we discussed one-way masking for personal protection with KN95s and N95s, but we just heard that CDC Director Dr. Raquel Walensky said, wearing a mask is an everyday precaution that people can take to reduce their chances of catching or spreading a respiratory virus. All right, it'd be nice if in addition to our saying that there was something you know, formal out of the CDC. But anyway, last week we discussed a single RCT comparing surgical to N95 um, mask use that failed to show a difference. Um, and as we mentioned, and as I got lots of communications, 
significant limitations. Um, first off, thank you. Those are some really, um, I think, well thought out, intelligent, um, and nice and respectful communication. So thank you for those that emailed me. Um, I'm going to drop in a link to the SIDRAP that provides some good criticisms. And as Vincent suggested last week, this is not a study showing that masks fail to work. Um, also, the comments by Michael Osterheim that 70% of participants came from Pakistan and Egypt amid community surges fueled by the Omicron variant later in the pandemic. As he says, it's highly likely that many, if not most, of these healthcare workers were infected outside of clinical care by virtue of high community rates of infection. So, you know, really important that, you know, if we discuss the study, realizing that just because it says those magic words RCT, that doesn't mean we can trust everything that comes out if it's not well designed and if there's limitations. But what about eye protection? The, the article, Effective Wearing Glasses on Risk of Infection with SARS-CoV-2 in the Community, a randomized clinical trial, like magic words, published in JAMA Network Open. These are the results of a randomized clinical trial conducted in Norway from February 2 to April 24, 2022. All adult members of the public who did not regularly wear glasses, had no symptoms of COVID-19, and did not have COVID-19 in the last six weeks were eligible. The intervention was wearing glasses, sunglasses, when close to others in public spaces for two weeks. <laughs> That's sort of an interesting study. A total of 3,717 adults, um, mostly women, 65.6%, um, mean, mean age, 46.9%. They were randomized, all were identified and followed up in the registries. 87% responded to the end. The proportions with a reported positive COVID test in the National Registry were 3.7% in the intervention group and 3.5% in the control group. So in this very short, limited RCT, wearing glasses in the community um, did not demonstrate a protective effect for the primary outcome. Um, but again, lots of limitations here. Um, if looking for a small effect, a, uh, a longer, larger study would be required. Um, and this leaves open questions about eye protections as part of PPE for COVID and other diseases, um, but interesting nonetheless. And I will, I will keep wearing my, um, my goggles with built-in um, readers in the bottom there. All right, don't forget about ventilation. Um, we've been talking about that over and over again. Um, you know, we've got another big holiday on the horizon, so now's the time to think about upgrading those systems. All right, COVID active vaccination, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. The vaccinated people still get infected. They are just less likely to die or have severe disease. So I got asked about this last week. And as an update, Pfizer-BioNTech did ask the FDA to authorize the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine for children under age five. But just for some context, children in this age group already have an authorized vaccine option, primary series, but only 2% of children under two and only 4% of two to four-year-olds have gotten their primary doses so far, according to the CDC. So we will we'll have to see the data regarding what benefit this might provide. Also a question of, of what, you know, what people will be considering uptaking this. But you know, for high-risk people, I think this will be a very important um, bit of information. All right, I'm gonna be moving right on to COVID, the early viral up for respiratory non-hypoxic phase, that first week. Um, this has become really simple. Paxlovid number one, remdesivir, three-day IV therapy if you have access, and then molnupiravir last and least. Monoclonals, pretty much gone. Um, there are now no um, approved monoclonal therapeutics in the United States. Um, some other parts of the world perhaps, but really avoid doing those harmful things. Now we move into the early inflammatory. This is week two. We, we would love, I would love a separate code uh, because this is what we care a lot about. Um, not exclusively, we care a lot about this in understanding those hospitalization. Um, steroids at the right time, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, remdesivir if early, immune modulation perhaps with tocilizumab or baricitinib. Avoid those unnecessary antibiotics and unproven therapies. And as I hoped, we actually have a good chunk for our late phase PASC long COVID. So the article, data-driven identification of post-acute SARS-CoV-2 infection subphenotypes was published in Nature Medicine. 
Um, this is a study where researchers used the electronic health record data of two large cohorts, Insight and one Florida Plus from the National Patient-Centered Clinical Research Network. They created a development cohort from Insight and a validation cohort from one Florida Plus, including 20,881 and 13,724 patients respectively who were SARS-CoV-2 infected and investigated their newly incident diagnoses 30 to 180 days after a documented infection. Through machine learning analysis of 137 symptoms, they had identified four reproducible PASC subphenotypes. One, cardiac and renal. That was about 37, 34% and 25.4 of the patients in the development and validation cohorts. A respiratory sleep and anxiety, 32.8% and then 38.5%, that's development and validation. And the musculoskeletal and nervous, 23%, and again, 23%. And the digestive and respiratory, sort of an interesting grouping here, 10% and 13%. They reported that these subphenotypes were associated with distinct patient demographics, underlying condition before SARS-CoV-2 infection, and acute infection phase severity. So really interesting. Um, I'm not going to go through all the subtypes in detail, but that subphenotype 1, subphenotype 2, 3, and 4. Um, really interesting to look at um, the, the different patients that made up these subgroups, um, also getting a sense of um, you know, what the acute presentation um, might foretell for the future. And I'm going to wrap it up there in this uh, stormy night on the banks of the Nile um, with what I always like to say, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I do want everyone to pause the recording right here and go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click donate. Even a small amount helps. We are now having our micro TV fundraiser. So during the months of December and January, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled by PWB up to a potential maximum donation of $40,000 to Micro TV. And I see Vincent smiling. Yes, I like that. And I encourage everyone to donate so that we can continue to do our science education work. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Amy writes, I was just listening to Saturday's episode of TWIV and heard a question about typhoid vaccination. We see lots of patients requesting vaccines and chemo prophylaxis for foreign travel. Vivotif is one, once again available at local pharmacies here in Brooklyn Heights. I have prescribed it a couple of times in the last month and patients have been successful in getting it. Until a couple of months ago, it wasn't even listed as an option in the prescription formulary in our EMR. This is good news for our patients as we don't carry the IM vaccine in our offices. Hope that's helpful to you and your listeners. And Amy is an emergency physician at CityMD. All right. Well, thank you to my colleagues at CityMD. And nice to know we've got that oral typhoid vaccine option again. So thank you. Nina writes, I'm a, as a 67-year-old asthmatic, I've been cautious about possible COVID-19 infection. After all this time, I was starting to think either I had already had COVID, but was asymptomatic, or I was somehow immune. I volunteer regularly in a kindergarten classroom. I received a text last week that a student had tested positive for COVID, and three days later, I did as well. Thanks to your podcast, I had a plan and had started Paxlovid. I'm happy to report that my doctor knew about Paxlovid, verified my last kidney function test and my disease timeline, and I got the prescription right away. Well, that is great to hear. So thank you for listening. And it's great to see that we're having an impact. And one more of these uh, feel good kind of emails, (laughs) Daniel. Steve writes, I'm a retired internist in the Philadelphia area. Early in the pandemic, one of my professors from medical school who is 93 and still active in medicine told me about TWIV and I have been watching ever since. The past weekend, I was visiting my grandchildren in Massachusetts As I was watching your discussion, Owen, my 19-month-old grandson, climbed into my lap and for a few minutes watched you very intently before climbing down to play with his toys. I have concluded that one is never too old, 93, or too young, 19 months, to watch TWIV. Many thanks to you and Vincent for your excellent discussions. (laughs) All right. Well, thank thank you very much. (laughs) Glad to hear that. 
All right, now we have a question from Linda. Question on what we do know when we are most infectious and do rapid tests equate infectiousness? I had a sore throat, day zero, rapid test negative. No surprise, was sneezing and a little tired the next day. Ran another test on day two, continued to approve, figured it was not COVID. A friend mentioned testing much later, so I retested four and a half days after symptoms and was strong positive. Retested day six, strong positive. I understand we can show symptoms earlier since vaccinated and the body reacting to the virus, but I was isolated when I was sick and not when I was not and later found out I did have COVID. So when was I likely to spread? I was fine on day four, just some not unusual for me sneezing here and there. I'm fine now and I'm positive, so I've isolated. Michael Minnis says rapid tests do correlate with virus cultures and that this is not just non-infectious particles. CDC says most contagious early on when I was actually negative, Granted, I did not test on day three. Any studies on when one is most likely contagious? Seems the, things seem to be changing. In retrospect, I might have put people at risk. Thankfully, I was masked, so perhaps I did not. Okay. Okay. All right, so this is a good one. I expect some hate mail from the Michael Mina um, followers, <laughs> um, <laughs> the cult he's created there. Um, but let's talk about the science, because, you know, I'm going to be critical. Michael Mina says stuff. He doesn't always reference an article. He doesn't always reference the science. He just says stuff. And so I'm going to say stuff, but I'm going to actually reference the science. So what is the science? What do we know? We've talked about a lot of the data over time. So one of the things that we know, and this is really well studied um, from the early days, is the day or two prior to symptomatic symptoms, we do see asymptomatic transmission. Um, as we know, some people continue to antigen test negative during that period of time. So there can be pre-symptomatic, pre-test positive transmission. Now, when we were doing all the stuff for Netflix and um, all the movie industry, um, Lionsgate, we were actually doing PCRs because we wanted to pick folks up before they, uh, before they spread it to others. And antigen tests sometimes take that day. Sometimes they actually don't turn positive until the day after symptom onset. So a negative antigen test, when you are having symptoms, is not a reliable indicator that you're not infectious. And we have a lot of studies that, that demonstrate transmission during that period of time before the antigen test turns positive. But now you've made your, your diagnosis with the antigen test. One of the other things we know is that 85 to 90% of transmission occurs one to two days before, up to day five of illness. There is some, but a very minimal amount, about 10 or 15% that occurs day six through day 10. We do know that a positive antigen test may correlate with culture positivity, but a positive antigen test after day 10, this is the science, does not correspond with transmission studies. So this whole idea, enough to detect, enough to infect, that may be catchy, but show me the science. I thought I'd give you a break today, uh, Daniel, on the questions since you're uh, in Uganda and it's pouring. So time to wrap it up. That's TWIV weekly clinical update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you, Vincent. And everyone be safe.